Greetings, comrades, and welcome to this day's very special episode, which I have named The Greatest. Why? Well, because I know that my interview, my interview partner here is a huge fan of boxing, and that's kind of a reference. Oh, well, never been very, very good at jokes. At any rate, uh, <clears throat> the man, the myth, the legend, uh, who has been named the King of Hawaii, and uh, recently has been in the very <clears throat> fiery hot south, well now, you're up here in the cold with me in the northeast. Welcome to the eastern border, Mr. Dan Carlin. I'll call that's you comrade from now on. That's quite an introduction. Thank you very much for having me. Well, uh, recently, you know, today's today is a special day here, and for those of you who listen later, and this will come out later as well, uh, today is the 9th of May. Today is the day when uh, all the Russian people here in Latvia celebrate their victory day, uh, like, over, over Nazis, and uh, it also marks 50 years of occupation for us. So in Latvia, it's not, not much of a celebration. At the same time, on the 9th of May in 2004, we joined the EU. So this day is... Um, it's all about dualities and, and and weird things which still are controversial everywhere. So we're having an we're so we're having this interview on a on a very excellent date, I'd say. Then this comes from a lot of my my Latvian listeners here. <clears throat> Everyone's been listening to your show as they should, and if someone hasn't listened to Dan's <laughs> show, then then you know you're missing out. But yeah, and then um, I'll I'll just quote here. <clears throat> Do you truly believe that if uh, ex Warsaw Pact countries didn't join NATO, we'd all be like kumbaya here and we'd be more peaceful. Poking the bear in about how Americans provoked Russia into, you know, all these activities that they've been up to. And you've mentioned that, you know, we shouldn't have joined NATO. So do you really think uh, that if all the ex Warsaw Pact countries, all the Eastern European countries who slipped away from the Soviet sphere, if we didn't join NATO, would we live in a better world? Okay, this is a long, complicated answer. Um, the first thing is, is to restate sort of what you said a little bit so, so that I'm clear on the parameters. It's not my position that we necessarily provoked uh, the Russians. It's that if we're going to, to get what we want, this is not, you know, when I advocate some of these ideas, this is not to make Russia happy so that they're happy. It's to help make some sort of a deal that becomes sustainable and in order for it to be sustainable, it has to work for everyone involved. So if you were going to bring in an arbitrator, let's say, who was going to try to figure out how to craft some sort of agreement that allowed stability, that kept the borders of, of countries intact, and that kept everyone with a certain level of security, you would have to take into account everybody's concerns. So one of the things I always point out here in my country, because we have a hard time doing this, I think all human beings have a hard time doing this, but I try to point out to people, try to look at things from the other guy's perspective, whomever the other guy is. When we talk about history in my history podcast, we'll talk about the other guy in the history podcast, you know? So in this sense, I always tell Americans, look at how this must look like from the Russian perspective. Now, Little side side note here that you are all very well aware of in Latvia. The Russians have an unusually traumatic history, especially the last century. If you said that that affected the culture and the civilization, I think that would be hard to argue with. Um, I think that needs to be taken into account, too, when you say, as some of the American representatives said, when they were explaining why nobody should worry about NATO expanding to Russia's borders, they said, NATO is a defensive alliance. Nobody has any reason to be afraid of NATO, which I happen to agree with. The problem is, is I don't live in a country with 100 years of, of terrible trauma, including being attacked by people that they were recently friends with and who basically told them they had nothing to worry about. So if the Russians are a little extra suspicious, I think it's worth knowing if we want to craft a sustainable agreement, that that's probably true. And there's probably good historical reasons for that. So if you accept something like Russia doesn't want to have what was very recently, historically speaking, an adversarial alliance system right on their border, then I back up and I say, OK, is that a realistic or reasonable thing to say or are they out of line? And so I think, OK, what would we feel like if we were in their shoes? The United States won't let a foreign alliance into this hemisphere, not our border, our hemisphere. We have something uh, you Latvians may or may not know about called the Monroe Doctrine, which is over 150 years old. 
and says that what Russia's worried about happening right on their border can't happen in the Americas. So in other words, if, if we had to live with what we're telling the Russians they have to live with, we wouldn't live with it. So the first thing then we have to admit is that what they're asking for is not unreasonable. So then the next question you have to ask, in my opinion, if you want to craft a sustainable agreement that keeps the peace, is how can we give them some of what they want while still getting what we want? In my opinion, and this may differ from what U.S. representatives behind the scenes really want. I don't think we always know what that is. But on the surface, I think what we want is exactly what people in Latvia want. You want border integrity. You don't want to have to worry about your country being taken over either literally the old fashioned way or in some sort of virtual sense, right? A virtual puppet, if you will. OK, so how can we get that while still giving Russia the security they need, because if you don't give them the security they need, it's not a matter of them having hurt feelings. It's a matter of creating the sorts of instabilities and problems that end up leading to a first world war situation or something. So you're not doing this. You had said kumbaya earlier. You're not doing this for kumbaya reasons. You're doing it so that the kind of deformities that, you know, everyone in your part of the world is very familiar with. I mean, look at how the first world war ended and how the twisted weird feelings of a of a Germany after that morphed into a nightmare. Well, that's something that you see not that bad, obviously, but that's a dynamic that you can see in multiple times in history. You don't want that. So the lesson to learn, in my opinion, from that is try to craft security arrangements that take into account what the other side is telling you is important to them. And when these decisions, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, were made in the United States, I and lots of people like me have always said that we kind of crafted what we call the new world order with a sort of triumphalist attitude about how we had to treat the now former Soviet Union. In other words, we didn't have to take into account how they felt because who the hell are they anymore? Well, that might work for a while, but if those people ever rise up again, that's going to stick in their craw, which is an American phrase we say here. That's going to stay with them and it's going to create instability, tit for tat situations like what we have now. Now, that's not the same as saying that it's our fault that this happened, but it does make us think about stability and say, if you want to avoid a third world war, I think you have to try to craft agreements that help give every side what they say they need. And we need something on our side, territorial and, and border integrity. And the Russians need something on their side, which in their minds is they don't want adversarial uh, alliances right next to them. And as I said earlier, the United States wouldn't want that either. Most countries don't. You don't like having the Russians that close, and I don't blame you. <laughs> well, uh, another question here. Have you read the Anna Polyutkovskaya's A Russian Diary? No. You, you, you should have, really. <laughs> you should read, you the, should read the, the list book. of things I should read is long. No, no, Anna Polyutkovskaya was uh, the Russian journalist who got murdered in 2000. And one of, five. one of the Russian journalists who got murdered, yes. Well, yeah, but she's, she's kind of the most the most famous one. And, oh, is uh, she the woman in, in, in the elevator? Am I thinking of the right one? Yeah, that yeah, one. Okay, so, so, I, so. I'm at least informed enough to know that. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm translating that that book from my Patreon supporters and, and presenting that in English. And well, I asked this question because in her book she speaks about the very beginnings of Putin and how he went for his re-election for just the second term in 2003 and 2004. And I have researched quite a lot, and on my show, I do believe that what you're facing here with the Russian administration is just a continuation of basically the same bureaucracy just you know with different letters it's no longer kgb it's fsb now and stuff like that because putin is essentially a kgb agent a spy in east germany and he's just a colonel there so it, it's a it's a complex issue right now and, and and he's getting a lot of opposition lately in his own country and and he's playing like Basically, if you if you live here and you look at what Putin's been doing and you compare it to the old methodology of the Soviet era on what the government was doing back then, you can draw a lot of parallels there. Except right now, there have been massive, massive protests against Putin's regime and all the corruption that's going on lately. Have you heard of Alexander Navalny and all the protests going on in Russia? Yes, that stuff does come out, and we do hear that kind of stuff. And and here's the way I look. And if you heard the latest Common Sense show, you've already heard this. But, I mean, in, in my mind, 
Uh, I, I'm not arguing with anything you say. Many historians will point out that in societies all throughout history, it's, it's more likely that you're going to have continuity than change, even if it looks on the surface like you're getting change. One reason you mentioned, the bureaucracies tend to be rather conservative and rather ingrown. They're tough to change. So if you told me that Vladimir Putin is really the Soviet Union light, I don't think I would find that that hard to believe at all. But as I said on the latest Common Sense show, if you were going to try to grade Russian leadership on a curve, in other words, what's normal for them, how do you grade Putin then? And I guess my point is, the Russians have this nasty habit of not wanting people in power or maybe putting people in power that they think they want, who then take away the right to change their minds later. But but people that we in the West don't want. Now, is that likely to change? I mean, what is reasonable for us to expect or want from Russian leadership? And I don't ask that question because I know I ask it because I think it's legitimate to ask. And and the same thing applies to them. I mean, again, to put the shoe on the other foot. What sort of leader do they have a right to expect? You know, what's the kind that they want in the United States? I mean, if some of that rumor mongering about them interfering in the election to get Donald Trump elected is true. OK, so is Donald Trump the kind of president that the Soviet Soviet Union, there I am going back into my old days, that Russia wants? And if they do, why do they want him? So those. Are, so, so I think that's worth taking a look at, too. I'm talking about talking about Russian leaders of these days. And, and like I said, when, when graded on a curve. Well, um, there's this there's this saying: you can't understand Russia with your mind. You have to apply your heart. And uh, every every leader that Russia has had was kind of one of the people. Russia has to feel that they have this strong strong man on the front there. And by the way, internet and the new media is changing that a lot because uh, right now we have in Russia people who are like just 18 to 20, very young people. And and who 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 like use the internet daily, who because internet penetrates all censorship and, and 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 propaganda, and they use internet daily and they know how it's like in other countries, and then they see their terrible corruption at home because we're we're speaking about approximately up to thirty percent of GDP corruption, and they see this and they no longer want to live like in a country run by this single person they they as, as they, a lot of them have reported to me they want to live in a normal country so i think that there is hope uh, that that maybe in the future we'll, we'll see someone who actually believes in democracy for starters well i think the problem too is that it's diff the transition period is difficult and i think you saw that with uh, the yeltsin era in russia and how the high hopes degenerated into more of a crony capitalism and oligarchs and everything. And the funny thing is, oh, they that happens here so, as well. It I was going to say they well, thought it yeah. was so terrible at the time. I wonder if they would trade it now for what they have now. Um, but but I think that that's a normal that the, the destabilized transition period is normal, and and that you have to survive that. You know, we call it a soft landing from communism. In this case, you would have to survive a soft landing from Putinism. Uh, and it's dangerous. It's, it's a weird time. And it's almost like taking a, a, a bone that you've broken in your arm and having to put a cast on it and then take it off and hope you just don't re-break it real fast. I mean, there's that transition period. And I think the pain and the, and the discontent and the, the destabilization that can go on during the transition period sometimes causes this backlash where people get so upset that they would rather have anything that would create order again or law or prosperity or minimum standards. And that's how you sometimes get people that no one would want. But, you know, as they said about Mussolini, he made the trains run on time. Right. So, I mean, I do think that one thing tends to lead in a, in a pendulum like fashion sometimes to the other. And that's what makes those transition periods, you know, uh, either from democracy to something else or from something else to democracy. So dangerous. Yeah. But, you know, Russia has gone pretty pretty scary lately as you know with all the events in, in crimea and recently one of the articles uh, that i that i read on them which is widely reported is that now they have military clubs in kindergarten like uh, kindergarten children get uh, get uniforms paid by the government and they they get to pretend that they're either in the spetsnaz or in the navy or in the border guard to defend themselves against terrible nato aggression okay but again to to look for continuity as opposed to change how close based on what you know is that from the old so soviet society oh well that's that's pretty the same thing 
I'm just yeah. saying yeah. it's it's exactly the same thing. And like on on and I've been reading all the all these uh, Russian propaganda news news sites preparing for this interview, and when they talk about NATO, like uh, they don't they don't write they sometimes write about exercises, but it's always this focus. For example, one of the articles is uh, is is a commentary from the Russian Ministry of Defense, which uh, excitedly states that mm, NATO fighter planes in Estonia can reach Saint Petersburg in ten minutes. Well, we do that NATO in our country too. Yeah. NATO soldiers are 100 kilometers from the Russian border, and massive building of, of panic, and and how America is is terrible and evil. Okay, but let me let me let me back you up for a second because now now this can help us understand something we talked about earlier. Now, forget whether or not that message from the Russian government to their people is true. Forget that part in terms of do they have anything to worry about? Why did we, meaning the United States and NATO? Why did we give the Russian government that fact to use that way? And uh, do you see what I'm saying? In other words, yeah. let's let one of the theories, and you, I'm sure you know all of them, but one of the theories on on why Putin is being more aggressive internationally is to detract the public from conditions at home. Yeah, exactly. Um, that, that, yeah, okay. That's, so, what, that's what I agree with. Yeah. Okay, so if that's the case then why would you feed him the ammunition to do that with? In other words, if if he's going to be in trouble, if people aren't afraid of things internationally and are focusing on the job he's doing at home, then wouldn't it be in the interest of anti-Putinites to see that people don't have that distraction, that they do focus on things at home and, and how he's doing for them? So why give them ammunition? For example, you know, I was thinking today because I knew this interview was coming up of some alternative scenarios because I talked to you earlier about, you know, can you get what you want in your case, Latvian territorial integrity without doing to the Russians what they don't want, without giving Putin that ammunition to scare his own people with about how close the NATO border is. And I thought of several different ways it can be done, but you have to actually care about Russia's fears to even want to do them. I mean, for example, I was thinking about all of the former Warsaw Pact members who feel very similar to the way Latvia feels. I mean, this fear of Russian um, aggression, of Russian minorities and how that could be used as, a, as an excuse for intervention, all those things. I mean, Latvia is far from the only former Soviet satellite that feels that way, correct? Well, we're all here stuck in the same bucket, so to okay, speak. Okay, exactly. So you have a shared interest, wouldn't you say? So forget about NATO for a minute, because I think that, as we say in this country, that horse has left. So we're having a theoretical discussion now. But but if you wanted to say, Dan Carlin, how would you craft a deal that would answer Russian concerns about having NATO, you know, 100 feet from their border, like like he's scaring his own people with, but still guarantee that the former Soviet satellites are not reabsorbed. The first thing I would suggest is, well, why don't all of them form an alliance together? I mean, the funny thing is you could call it the Warsaw Pact. The only difference is, is that instead of looking you know, west for their enemies, they would be looking east for the people that they had to offset. Now, the first thing you say to that is, well, there's no way that those countries are going to be any match for Russia's military, but that's not the point. By the, the, way, the, way, is, by, by the way, Dan, uh, this has been attempted after, in, in the, the interwar period, Yosef Pilsudski had this intermarium idea, except he kind of saw this, saw it as a more federated, federated thing, and then he took Vilnius from Lithuanians and, and managed to ruin his reputation over here in these parts. <laughs> it's just too tempting, isn't it? You get so close and it's just too tempting. No, but you see, my, po my point is yeah. that it's... If we're looking to, you know, I, I've also, the, the other idea you can do is create, I call it the Star Trek Romulan neutral zone idea, where you have a, a zone where NATO is not right on the border with Russia. In other words, maybe maybe all the countries on Russia's border are demilitarized. And you basically say that if anybody violates the borders of the neutral zone, it's the same thing as attacking a NATO Article 5 protected country. Um you know, so so in other words, you still get what Latvia wants, which is some sort of guarantee that they're going to have the deterrent of the rest of the world backing them up. But then Russia also gets what they don't want. They don't have to have NATO right on their border. Does that, in other words, a deal that satisfies the number one concerns of both parties. Does that make sense? Yeah, but uh, that would, that that falls into one one very important drawback there that requires competent politicians. Well, listen, if we have to base ideas on competent politicians, we might as well stop right now.
Because <laughs> I, in, in te- technically, this is a great idea, but uh, yeah, <clears throat> I'm not very proud of my own my own country's um, political elites, so to speak, as well. well but, my, but my point to you is that there's this <laughs> yeah. attitude that if you don't do it the way we're doing it now with NATO, that there's no other way to achieve what you want. And, you know, it's like that old line that if 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 all you're armed with is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Um, that That's what that is a little bit, because we never cared when the Cold War ended what the hell Russia thought. And if they said we're worried about this, we didn't care about that either. Well, the reason you should care now is because they're telling their own people don't look at our corruption here inside our country. NATO's right on our border. Doesn't that scare you? So, I mean, we played into this. It's it's not like, it's not like kumbaya, like you said. I know, it's I know. That was that was really a weapon. Uh, one of the things that, that Russia is doing right now about this information is that they don't just focus it on their own country. They focus it on the Russian minorities outside here. And one of the things that I wanted to know is how exactly, you know, how how Russian times work in the United States. Like how the Russian media machine works there. Because over here, for example, they just post completely false facts. Like European Union has now set up a specific, like the, the European Union has set up an organization whose only task is to basically debunk whatever Russia throws at us. Because uh, when when you think that when you think that you know your 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 press gets some fake stories and hey that 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 might be there for for supporters of both Republicans and Democrats, even though I hate the two party system, uh, but yeah they they just they just post whatever happens to be in their mind on the on this day and and then they hire professional commenters who just would sit in the comment section and kind of create this peer pressure and create this attitude you know, uh, it's it's hard to explain this. But imagine this: you you read an article, which in Russian, which has been, or or just you know a regular article, but there are paid paid commenters there, and like an article says something good about America, for example, and then there are commenters which create fake profiles in the social media and everywhere, and they sit there in the comment section and they create this attitude that uh, basically everyone in Latvia thinks that this is nonsense and that, you know, this this whole, this bullshit, they all, they all are lying to us. And and, and the fact is that they, they create this atmosphere where the people start to think, well, maybe it's true because there are so many comments that, you know, Latvia is dying right now and that NATO has occupied Latvia and that, that you know, uh, evil Soros Foundation are, secret, are secretly controlling Latvia and that... Uh, Evil Jew, homosexualist, fascists are are just trying to push their their things here in this region, and they create this. And a lot of people who uh, let's just say are not friends with critical reasoning, and that's that's a stone in my government's garden because yeah, I, I wish I wish they do more about quality education, but they don't, and, and so so they manipulate manipulate the kind of the mood of the people via these fake comments. On, on normal articles, and then they just spew out a lot of nonsense that really has to be countered somehow, all the time. I mean, do they do something like this in the United States, or don't you feel it as much, or, or how's, how's the comment sections when it comes to, like, something related to Russia, or something that Russia might be interested in, in, in the United States? Well, I think, and you know, I could be wrong about this, especially since we're living through it right now. It's always tough to see in, when you're in the middle of it. But I mean, I think we're we're seeing something that's a real facet of our 21st century world. And this is really the first generation that's ever had to try to figure out not just how to deal with exploitation like this, but maybe how, when you want to do it as a country, how to do it yourself. I mean, I, I think the Russians are showing a particular flair. For this um, in terms of doing it well and figuring out multiple levels on which to operate. But I don't think it's in, in, in a conceptual sense a whole lot different from what China does or Iran does or a bunch of other countries, including the United States in some ways does. I don't think we've quite figured out when something crosses the line between, um, you know, like I heard Dick Cheney not that long ago was talking about how maybe cyber uh, war should be considered the same thing as real war, but but oh, Russia, of- Russia, by the way, has now officially put cyber war 
uh, as in their military doctorate, and they have this special like army section now devoid, like devoted to cyber warfare. It's called right, but, but, thing. But but here's the way. thing. For example, we don't know what we mean. So like when we talk about Russian interference in U.S. elections, like in this last presidential campaign. What does Russian interference in U.S. elections mean? Does it mean they're hacking the vote counting machines so they give you wrong vote totals? Does it mean that they've got an army of paid trolls spreading Hillary disinformation? Does it mean that the Kremlin itself is hacking into the Democrats' computers and then giving the information to WikiLeaks that they then release to the world? But it's biased because they don't do the same thing for the Republican candidate. So I guess what I'm saying is, is there's a whole long list of things that we could put into the category of cyber warfare, cyber espionage, cyber propaganda, and no real clear idea yet, because it's really relatively new where the lines are. I mean, if you say it's not warfare if a bunch of paid trolls spread false information, but it is a reason to go to war if you hack our vote counting machines. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is nobody knows about this yet. This is the kind of thing where if this was a new weapons system, 50 or 60 years ago, they would start talking about the fact that it's probably time that we sit down and have an international conference and start hammering out some treaties where the the, the people involved can actually decide, okay, when are we going to say, in other words, if the Russians say, well, if you put out a piece of fake news, uh, it's war, and then continue to put out fake news, well, I think you know that they've crossed the line. Right now, these lines are invisible. Do you know what I'm saying? There is no line in the mm. sand that says if you do that, it's automatically war. So all's fair until until we figure out some rules. This is this is kind of the part of the new world that we're living in. That's and, you know, right. And, and, that's and exactly this, right. And the thing is, what what you might be interested in is um, another thing which I wrote in that long email is that my government is trying to deal with this because we have parties which directly receive funding from Russia's Yina Russia Party, their, their United Russia Party, and they do all these other things. So in response, my government, which basically consists of people who also don't know what they're doing, uh, especially when it comes to this, they start to put out some crazy laws here. And uh, one of these things was this uh, this thing which basically they made this preamble to our constitution, which is the first document ever written by politicians, which people can't really change. It's unamendable. And then you can't really dis and then you can't discuss some aspects of the World War II in like any shape or form and that can be terribly abused and they, they they just freak out and they start to do some crazy controls on the media and that means that the regular media in my country and in a few other countries of the region we're we're like feeling it we're feeling it a lot that you know in our government's attempts to fight this they're actually hurting hurting the freedom of speech and hurting our, our press really so that, that's why podcasts and new media uh, are starting to become more and more popular here. That's why, well, hey, I've, I've grown so large because they, they can't chain me in. Well, but not to defend your government because they probably don't deserve it. But at the same time, they're trying to figure out under a great deal more pressure, by the way, than a lot of other powers, obviously, what you do to deal with this new threat. I mean, once upon a time, if you remember, the Russians were afraid of the threat that the destabilization from a propaganda source like Radio Free Europe could cause. Well, what we have today makes that look like children's games, you know? And, and so if, if those were the kinds of propaganda that were around when I was a kid in terms of trying to reach the foreign population, look at what even well-meaning governments that are trying to protect their own people and their own sovereignty, look at what they have to try to adapt with on the fly as it's happening. So, I mean, I do have some sympathy in the sense that it's not like we know what the right decision is and the wrong decision, and they're consciously making the wrong decision. Everybody is sort of improvising here under, in your case, a great deal of pressure, trying to figure out ways to cope. Yeah, and it, and it backfires, and, and this is this is one of that's very possible, just... of course. Yes, Murphy's law. <laughs> well, that, that kind of always works, and, and this is this is why I want to turn turn on on the new media, and um, I want to, I want to hear your opinion on the new media and how it all 
how it's been shaping up and how it how it fits in this new world of informational warfare and everything. How is how has way, it been shaping not, up? Not to, not to back, I did forget one thing though that is worth pointing yeah, out. Sure, sure. Um, which is that you know we think about the governments of the world trying to Im- impact elections and all those kinds of things. I, I was reading something the other day that was talking about how many people in the United States working just for their own selves and their own interests were working to try to help the Le Pen campaign in France. And so if you're French and you're worried about foreign involvement in your elections, do you worry about all those Americans who want to see, you know, Marie Le Pen win the election? So, I mean, it, it, where you draw the line, I mean, the, the fact that foreign, foreign non-official people in one country can impact the election of people in a completely different country, that is so wild when you think about it. I mean, that's something that's been... I can't think of a historical parallel right now. Oh, so. but, but this this is this is going on all, all the time, and uh, I, I I sit on some of these boards because I like to read read the fringes, and uh, when I when I read uh, like on respectable newspaper newspaper articles that you know the the OK side with with just made in a specific way that's actually a white power symbol and they reported it as real well i was there on the threads on the internet when you know trolls on 4chan decided to make this their new project you know they just troll people with this they produce very reliable fake stuff and then they just watch how the media reports it as real and it's you crazy know, we, used, we used to have a debate um and this is 15 years ago now but i used to hang out with some very very uh, amazing computer guru kind of people and they would sit there and speculate over a cigarette, uh, you know, what was going to happen in the future. And I remember we talked about this one an awful lot. What was going to happen when governments couldn't keep their secrets anymore? And I remember one day the conversation turned and one of these computer gurus in the smoking circle um, said that, and I'm not one of the smoking people, but the conversation was too good to pass up. Um he said, what's going to happen is once the governments cannot control the kind of information that comes out, they will do the equivalent of putting out white noise or jamming so that you can't trust anything, so that the, the truth is drowned out by so much other stuff that you, you, you have the same effect as if you could keep the truth secret. You could hide it in plain sight. And so in my mind, when we talk about the fake news this isn't just a Russian thing. This is a way to make sure that we can't have what people 15 years ago assumed we would, which is that the openness of the internet era was going to act like a disinfectant for all the nasty, corrupt, terrible stuff going on behind the scenes. Because it could never, that's why they keep it secret to begin with, right? Because the public outrage would be so terrible, they'd be forced to change. Well, if you can't prevent that anymore in the era of Edward Snowden and WikiLeaks and everything else, well, then maybe you can jam it with so much disinformation that truth becomes something that you could easily deny, even if it's staring you, even if the facts are staring you right at the face. So, I mean, I think that's what this maybe is, is the is this is the new secrecy and it's hiding facts right out in the open. Yeah, it would kind of kind of makes sense in a way, because what, what else what else the government will do? But yeah, talking about that, I'm I'm kind of here because my got my country literally we we have extremely fast internet, but we have no laws concerning new media, and I happen to get on this work group uh, that that'll that'll kind of consult our Ministry of Culture, which is now tasked with you know creating some regulations and you know just legal basis for the new media. So I'd like to ask you, you know, if if you had a chance, and you have like a real chance, if you had a chance to, you know, write some laws about concerning new media, what would you put in there? What must be in there to make sure that everything works out fine? And I mean, uh, <clears throat> and this is where I, as an apprentice, climb up my 10,000 steps to the great master and, you know, you you started this whole thing, Dan. Well, at least you popularized it in, in masses, so hey. <laughs> If you had a chance to write laws concerning new media and podcasting and people on YouTube and everywhere, what would you put in there? Well, first of all, those are very, very nice things for you to say. Thank you. I, I don't know if they're true, but that's really nice thing to have on my tombstone. Um, I have to tell you that that I tend to be the kind of person who thinks, you know, that what you said earlier is true, that that you tend to muck it up with inadvertent side effects and and unintended consequences if you legislate too much. I do think you have to have some rules that say, 
you know, one kid in school can't do another podcast about killing another kid in school. I mean, there's got to be some very basic rules that, that say things like that. You know, you can't have a, a video blog showing your neighbor undressing in their backyard. I mean, basic things. But other than that sort of stuff, I mean, I would tend to feel that less regulation is better. Uh, a libertarian in my country, which is a political point of view that tends to uh, feel that the ultimate thing to have is more freedom, would suggest that the the legal system could handle that, that you could have lawsuits. I don't like that idea because I think that would be a way to shut everybody down. But it's another alternative maybe to having the authorities involved, for example. Um, but but I, I think I would keep it at a bare minimum and just say no personal threats. I'm sure my government would say no classified information. Um, uh, but other than that, I mean, there's certain obscenity things you still can't do, uh, or show in the country. Those would have to be on the list. But, but other than that, I would keep it at a bare minimum and just cross my fingers and hope we could live with the results. Well, that, that kind of, kind of makes sense again, <laughs> but yeah, over, over here, our courts work a bit, bit differently. We, we don't have that strict libel laws, <laughs> but uh, oh, yeah. we don't have them here either. Over over here, they're trying to more or less figure out how to tax us, essentially, because uh, you you can get taxed on your income only based on what you're doing on this register of professions. And at one point, they wanted to they wanted to force everyone who who makes an income from the podcast or blog or whatever to kind of create a uh, LLC. Uh, as as far as I recall, that's how it's called in English: that limited liability company, right. and and pay taxes as that. Plus, we have this kind of, uh, it's called ACALA, the kind of the copyright protection agency, which blanket covers every content creator ever and you, whom you also have to pay some things. That's why we're creating our own kind of the association here, because uh, if, if we get put under that one, then it's going to be terrible because those guys are famous for, for like doing crazy things such as uh, they find a punk rock band who had their like, 20th anniversary concert they just you know rented rented a place and just created the free concert and their anniversary for like their relatives and friends and everything and the representatives from that akala thing showed up and said hey it's an unsanctioned concert please pay a fine here so you know you can't you can't reliably do that but but we're, we're trying to fight that thing so you know well, that seems that seems a little out of my area of expertise. Um, yeah, but but this, I, this is, this I would this suggest is like... that bureau bureaucrats and taxing go together pretty pretty famously, though, don't they? Well, you know, you can't escape death and taxes. Got to but... fund the machine somehow. Wow. And and while all are still here, do you have any advice on the new podcasters? I, for for new for new podcasters, really, for people who are starting out, for people who are whom you've inspired. To be honest, you're the fire starter. <laughs> you, you get you to... have to you have to stop it with that you're gonna give me a make my head explode um my wife no, will no, not come, be able to live be, with me that's that's what <laughs> that would be the bullet from the kgb agent I, so I, I will say i will say to my wife do you realize how famous i am honey and she'll go right that yeah right um no listen he, you know i give the same advice all the time and, and and i've spoken with you about this before about my concept of throwing away early shows um you know, when I when I started off, I started off in, in the era of radio. And one of the great things about radio for newcomers was that generally they don't save uh, the radio broadcast. And they may now, but they didn't then. And so if if I made some terrible, egregious, what we would call here today a rookie mistake, uh, and, and you weren't listening to my show that day, you missed it. And you never heard it again. And I got away with it. And so those things don't come back to haunt me. I got to learn in a very forgiving environment. But if you're starting out today and you're podcasting the very first time you've ever talked into a microphone and you're putting out that out on the Internet, well, that's going to be there forever. Uh, all, all of your learning mistakes when you're some big famous star someday are going to be on somebody's website somewhere. So somebody can see, you know, every not just every mistake, but you, you really learn how to be clear uh, the more you do it. And the problem with not being clear in this environment, in this world right now, is you can say something that you mean a completely different way. But if only 1% of your audience interprets that to mean something totally differently, and maybe they interpret it to mean, let's just say in this country, 
you say something that you mean in a completely innocuous way, but 1% of your audience thinks it's racist because they misunderstand what you say. Well, that can get you in trouble. And that the only real reason that you have that trouble to begin with is because you hadn't learned yet how to speak clearer and make what you want to be known more understandable. That's something that comes with time. But you hate to have that saved for time immemorial, you know, where you made your terrible mistake on your third show ever. So I tell people sometimes, you know, when you're just starting out, do three or five shows exactly the way you want to do them. Pretend that they're good enough to release and then throw them away. And then the sixth show you do will be the first show for your listeners. But you'll sound like a person who's already done six shows and you'll have that experience. So I always say that. Um, and in terms of, of other advice, it, it, you know, there's there's two ways to make it in podcasting, it seems to me. Way number one is to get lucky with a gimmick. So maybe you're some really beautiful girl and you do some show where all you do is go on there and talk about sex and 10 million people tune in because it's just titillating. There are people who have many different gimmicks out there like that one that can get you noticed real fast. But but are you still around a year from now? I mean, how do you make that sustain? The other kind of thing is putting in the hard work, as as many most podcasters do, and, and building your audience up over time by by putting out consistently good that doesn't mean it all has to be good but good enough so that you keep your audience and you add to them you know consistently good work over time we call it putting in the dog years um and and i think that's how most podcasters do it and the good news is that with that approach you're actually getting better all the time so that as you gain more and more listeners you're becoming better and better so that by the time you have your your maximum audience you know, you've really built yourself up into a professional outfit. So those are the two pieces of advice I have about stick, sticking to it. And then maybe, like I said, trying to get some of your worst mistakes out of the way before anyone else gets to hear them. Well, I have to, I have to agree there. And um, what I also want to mention is that shows really change over time a lot. Oh, yes. You, oh, you, boy. You, only, only like after, after you've done, I, I will also think that my, my first good episode was like number five when I did the Afghanistan war. And and then then there was the Chernobyl episode. And and Dan, you might not know because I know you don't listen to podcasts. But when I I did the Chernobyl episode and I went out to the countryside and actually interviewed people who were there and who like making sure to play kind of cleaning up the place. And and that was that was very emotional because I understood how I want to do my show when I was just sitting there with them and before they even talked to me and I got their experiences and their stories. I had to buy them like moonshine, about you know a couple of liters of moonshine. I had to drink it with them. Or else they wouldn't speak with me like at all. Okay, but and you have to clarify what you said. You can't just say I don't listen to podcasts. You have to explain I don't consume any media, pretty much other than than text based media. And it's just because there's no time. Uh, but it's it's not because I'm prejudiced against podcasts or any media. I don't watch television. I don't. I mean, I really don't. I, I'm strictly a reader. Uh, basically, so it's it's nothing against podcasts at all. It's just I know, a, I know. It's a time it's, question. It's just a piece of 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 dance trivia material, which, by the way, is, is out there online. <clears throat> by the way, did you know that first hardcore history episode was only fifteen minutes long? Uh, it really was only fifteen. And if I'd known it was going to be as long as they were now, I think I would have been scared off. Uh, it, it, but it, but it grows with time. I think. Well, I was going to really say, doesn't changes. that really back up your point about how the things evolve with time? And 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 that's good because you'd never. I don't think you'd stick with it if you knew where you were going to be and how much work was going to take. But by the time you look back and you've got five or seven or ten years behind you, sometimes it looks like a. Sometimes it looks like a book that you started and you write, you know, just a page or two a day, and and then you turn around one day and you've got a three hundred and fifty page book and you don't know how you did it. And and I know that's how a lot of podcasters feel. When you're on episode fifty-five or seventy-five or one hundred and five. Oh, I, I I don't even know which episode I'm on right now. But yeah, that's that's exactly true. You just start doing it and then it kind of grows. By the way, uh, latest news because you know I'm 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 sitting here on on all the feeds and <clears throat> Lentaru, you know the Russian news aggregator just posted a news article which I'd like you to comment on because <clears throat> the Russian side apparently just gave a statement to. State Secretary, they, they gave some information to the State Secretary of the United States. Oh boy, I'm reading this in Russian. Uh, declared what the United States need to do to normalize the relationship with Russia. And um, this is this is one of those, if you if you read some Orville, and not like uh, 1984, but Orville's commentary on how politicians use their speech, which is great. Mm. Russian side stated that the Obama administration had... Uh, 
had broken international international rights and went and I'm I'm, I'm translating directly here <clears throat> and went to factical factical expropriation of the objects of diplomatic representation of Russia in the United States which legally are Russian state property and thus uh, have immunity. I'm not sure what they're talking about there. Me, me neither. And I read fluent Russian. Hmm, I don't know what they're... Essentially, what I understand from this is that uh, it's it's a nice way of stating, hey, guys, guys, you have frozen our assets. And that's terrible. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see that as anything out of the normal diplomatic yelling and screaming, do you? No, th that's completely okay. I'm just surprised that they... If that's what it is. I mean, you know, maybe we'll find out tomorrow there's more to it. But if that's what it is, I protest your freeing of our assets and okay. I don't know. This is this is this is what what kind of kind of always always happens. Every everything you know has to be commented on, and and all these things all these things go on. And sometimes when I discuss discuss this continuity and everything, I was going on. Uh, for starters, when I, when I look at Trump and your administration and this, take it as a joke or something, if you will. But uh, I'm starting to believe in reincarnation when I look at him. I mean, and you who, who and does you, he remind you of Khrushchev. <laughs> Just think about it. Think about it. No, he's a, he's the opposite. If Khrushchev could be born with this with a golden spoon in his mouth this time, <laughs> no man, they're they're both like uh, very rich people. Okay, Khrushchev wasn't technically rich; he was de facto rich, so to speak, because the Soviet Union's economy didn't work as you as, as you you would expect. But you're talking about guys who use a lot of bombast and. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they 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 like to make crazy bombastic loud statements, and they all are fans of huge weird infrastructure projects. And hey, they're, they they like Khrushchev actually built a wall, and now Trump wants to build one. Huh? We'll see how that goes. But I don't know uh, about the wall. Uh, this is this is a big big point here because uh, over here in Latvia we we've, we've had a lot of discussions on this. Would the wall actually keep anyone out? Like I, I'm not sure how is how is that supposed to work, and and maybe I'm I'm not an American, so I maybe don't understand something. But how is a physical wall going to keep out anyone unless you build it like Khrushchev's Berlin Wall with barbed wire and machine gun turrets? It's it's a more complex issue here when you get down on the ground. I'm from that part of the country where the border is, and. The, the, the dirty little secret that everybody from down there understands is that the very powerful business interests, especially the agricultural interests out there, but also things like the hospitality and restaurant industries, all of them depend on those people coming over the borders. And all of those entities are powerful players in the political game. They all give a lot of money. Um, this is one of the reasons that the immigration reform efforts that Ronald Reagan's administration in the middle 1980s tried to put together, one of the reasons that it fell apart, because while all these people want to see uh, the border better patrolled in middle America and other places, there's a reason all those people come over the border in the first place. They're not coming over the border to not get paid at a job somewhere. There are jobs. And the people who use those people use them for a reason. You know, I mean, so my point is, is that there's there's heavy duty economic interests on this side of that non-existent wall that want those people coming in. And so that's the dirty little secret. And that's where behind the scenes money is changing hands right now to make sure that no matter what they say in public, maybe this wall never really gets built at all. Well, I don't know. It, it it seems like just a silly idea in general. But then again, politics these days have turned into I don't know. A, 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 that the, it's been the theme of this whole show: the, the, the silly politicians and and the no, stupid but, politics. No, but see, ten years ago, like ten years ago, it, when when I was when I was like seventeen, turning eighteen, um, uh, then then it seemed like you know everything was progress and clear cut and we're we're going to more friendlier relationships and nothing unexpected can happen and everything's super stable and has been for years and now boom yes but in all fairness look at where you were coming from i mean i mean you know when you're leaving the soviet union 
it all looks brighter, you know? Uh, so, so it's a little like what our country in the United States has with the way things were for us after the Second World War. It was about 20 years of rainbows and unicorns with our economy and everything else where people got used to that and thought that's how it's always going to be because, you know, we had a Great Depression, then a Second World War, and then boom, 20 years of crazy prosperity. You know, it didn't seem like it at the time, but looking back on it now, it was crazy prosperity, but it was coming out of a terrible period like the Depression. You know, when you guys were in the Soviet Union uh, against your will and you get out of that, everything looks, you know, the grass looks green, the air smells sweet, future looks bright. Now you settle down to a new level of normalcy and you're grading things a little bit differently and you guys end up looking more like the rest of us. <laughs> Murphy's Law, everywhere you look. No, but I think I think this is the norm because you know from from personal experience because well, I grew up in the early nineties and, and it was it was like this we, we looked at the America and we thought you know you're the greatest country on planet Earth and everything's better in America and and then when you start to learn about things how it's actually there and you start to appreciate what's going on here but uh, this this terrible terrible idea that this terrible thought that you know coming to democracy completely anew and having to learn all of the situation. Oh boy, it, it leads to terrible horror and terrible poverty because the the adaptation to free market prices it was just dreadful. Like people people went people went from from about like two hundred rubles a month to about twenty lats a month. Like they, they suddenly your salary gets cut like ten times. In all uh, fairness, though, terrible. let's understand something. This again to wrap up what we've been talking about. This is that that transition era for Russia under uh, the Yeltsin era that we were talking about earlier, where it is it's so difficult to have that soft landing. And if you're not patient or if or if things don't get better in a reasonable amount of time, people start looking for people maybe that they would not choose otherwise who promise to at least get some money in your paycheck, get some food on your table, stop the bad guys from robbing you, make the trains run on time. And so, I mean, I think I think you got a, a little taste all in, in all the former Soviet republics of of how it feels that this this terrible period where you have to adjust and soft landings from communism don't necessarily have to work out well. You know, I think you guys are lucky you didn't end up with something more like what Belarus has or something. I mean, it can go that way, too. Belarus, by the way, they have signed the, this unification treaty with Russia and they're technically supposed to become federated with Russia once again in like 2018. Well, that will be interesting, won't it? It, it will be, but you know, Lukashenko, the Belor Belarusian leader, he's he's kind of weird and he's also used for propaganda here in these parts. Like, uh, for example, we don't, we, we have, we have we have better healthcare than your country, I'm sorry, but Belarus has just very socialized everything and I have people who are just, you know, using this for propaganda and they state, uh, they state that, you know, we should have like strong leader like Lukashenko because there you can like get your livers transplanted for free. And, and then you ask them, well, how much does a computer cost in Belarus? And, and then they don't know. You always have to pay for something. And, and yeah, how that's, happy that's are the they? Do, do you have any inside information? How happy is the population in Belarus? Depends. Depends on what's going on. Uh, your average citizen is it, it's pretty much like Soviet era. It's kind of like that because people are not particularly unhappy. But the, see, everyone who's in opposition has been put in prison. You can like if you demo, if you if you protest against something, you easily get thrown in prison. But mostly, it's just like just like this post-totalitarian uh, Brezhnev and, and drop of all these like very late Soviet era. Where you know you have basically come and understood that you know you can't do anything politically, so you know you might as well do something. You know you might you might as well care about your own well-being. You just pay lip service to the government, and then you kind of try to manage your own life. It's something. So of there's that no sort. chance. There's no chance of him being Ceausescu'd or anything like that. Oh no, I, I don't think so. No, not not in Bel at least not as far as I know of, because the, uh, the he oppresses the opposition quite quite harshly there. Not as harsh as Putin. Uh, but, but you know, I, I think the people have just, you know, grown used to him in a while, so to speak. Okay, so let me ask this. If something like that did happen and there was there was protest in the streets and unrest in, in that country, do you think the Russians would come in and interfere? Oh, yes, of course. 
Interesting. Obviously, no questions about that. Because uh, Russians interfere whenever they want to interfere. One thing that I like to specifically point out is that a lot of people think that Russians only fund and support like these far-right populist candidates. Well, over here in Eastern Europe, they support left candidates. Because the left was where all the ex-socialists went after the Soviet Union collapsed. So, in a weird situation, you, you know about that there are these inter-party international organizations, right? Like Democrats sure, sure, are... Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so, uh, like, the Republicans are in the same party organization with our kind of right-wing party, but their policies couldn't be different, because our right-wing party are the guys who are, like, conservationist in the sense that they're all pro-environment and, and pro-welfare stuff, but the Democrats are in the same organization with the party that receives funding from United Russia. Because they're kind of left-leaning. Party politics are weird. Yes, and different in every country. And the terms don't mean anything anymore when you when you cross borders. I mean, it, what what North Korea is a democratic country, if you believe their hype. <laughs> yeah, the, I call my, my own, like, I, I run a small political show as well that I interview people, and then because of North Korea, I, I named it People's Democratic Republic of Podcast. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> if something is and it's a dictatorship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if something is named Peoples and Democratic, then, you know, they had to put it in the title because otherwise nobody would know. It, we're a dictatorship, but we take donations on PayPal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, hey, if, 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 if podcasting is dictatorship, then uh, I, I'm sure you know, but <clears throat> Ben, if he exists, is, is the real real leader of the show. Uh-huh. The the yeah, person the person who edits the thing is just just <laughs> let's, let's just say editors have far more power than listeners believe. I always say if there is a Ben, he's our European staff considering how late he gets up. Not as well because we we the time zone differences with Europe are crazy, but uh, you know, I I get to sleep in though. So so finally, uh, my podcast is mostly about Soviet history and everything and yeah, then you get to pick an episode I'll make you pick something that you would find very interesting about the Soviet Union, and I'll make a show on that one in the oh. future, a special. And secondly, if you have any questions whatsoever, like that one thing you always want to know about Soviet Union, well, here's your chance. Oh, you got to give me time to think about that, because I'll pull out some books and find out some stuff. Uh, you, you can't, you can't do that when I've been thinking about a completely different historical period all morning and all week. Oh no, no. It, it, <laughs> It continues the previous stuff, the previous thing that we've been talking about, man. Well, I tell you what, I, I, the, the Soviet, the, the Civil War and the interwar years and the 1920s stuff with Poland, all that stuff is fascinating. And some of those characters are wonderful. I, I need to do more research on them. But but in the days when I used to read some of that stuff, I found that to be an incredibly interesting period. And and as you probably already know, explains a lot about how the 1930s developed. Oh yeah, I'm into episode nine of that those series on the Russian Revolution, and I've I've gone down to 1921 by now. It is amazing. It's like people tell me all the time too that they would want to hear me talk about the French Revolution, which is just as complicated. And you say, "Oh my gosh, you don't know what you're asking." I mean, it would it would be like nine parts, and 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 it's so in depth, and there's it's 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 very complicated stuff, isn't it? It is, but you know, this is also something very different that I've done before because Russian Revolution is the first period in life where I just can't go and interview people and ask their experiences, like I did with my Chernobyl episode and, and things. But but yeah, it, all all the sides that are fighting in the Russian Civil War and all the independence wars of the Baltics and Poland and Finland and and everywhere else, it's like you know. Everyone, it's it's a free for all, basically. Everyone's fighting yes. everyone all the time. And there, and and th th and th and th and there are Czechs the marching through Russia, capturing yes. land on the way. Yes, and, and and all of the lost, the atrocities that just happened that no one even knows about. That in the middle of some forest somewhere. I mean, there's so much lost history in that story is yet to be uncovered. Maybe that'll never be uncovered. So it's fascinating stuff. Well, listen, you've done nine episodes on it. How long is it going to go? At least five more. At least five more. <laughs> Maybe you'll set some new record for for the longest episodic series of podcasts. No, no, that 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 record belongs to Mike Duncan. He did. He actually did French Revolution. That's right. Mike did the whole Rome thing. How many was that? Oh, I don't even know. 
That's crazy. I forgot. How could I forget about that? That's a classic. Uh, by the way, sometimes people kind of try uh, on, on the podcasting metasphere, people kind of try to put you in, in the one side and Mike on the other one. And then there are like these these two great deities of podcasting. And with, with oh, Pantheon that's terrible. The... No, you know what's great? One of the great things about podcasting is that I started off in the old media of TV and radio and everything. And back then, the assumption was that it was a zero sum game where if you're listening to one TV show, then you're obviously not watching the other one. And so it was a competition for your eyeballs. Well, once taping comes around, well, now you can watch both shows, right? You just don't have to watch them live. Well, that's what podcasting is like. We don't compete with each other. We enhance each other. And so I never think about it in terms of either or. I mean, Mike is pushing the limits of, of history podcasting, and that's good for all history podcasters. That's how I look at it. I mean... The episode. I mean, you have to put a lot of work in to put out an episode in in, in the, some period of time, and like people have plenty of time to listen to literally everything else in between, especially oh with God. you. With that. They, 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 I was gonna say they could grow old waiting for a podcast from me. <laughs> no, it's it's weird. Uh, also, I have I have uh, I have actually translated some of your episodes for dad. You know, I actually sat down and translated your your shows for my dad because he doesn't speak English, so that was pretty fun. I, I have hope to do used all the same vocal intonations that I use. <laughs> no, but I have learned to say end quote, end quote from end quote. <laughs> you know, it's funny because that's that that is something, you know, I don't know about things I invented, but I invented what the end quote thing is about because we ran into a unique problem when when we started doing the podcast and I started to have to uh, refer to expert testimony i guess you could say more and we needed the same things that books had when books have footnotes you know and 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 i didn't know what we were going to do to have something where i could footnote something and so we created what we call audio footnotes and that's what the quote end quote thing is that that's an audio footnote for us and so that helps me you know who am i to tell you this historical event happened i'll talk about some interesting angle and then we'll quote a real historian with an audio footnote, and I'll say quote, and then I'll say end quote, and then you know that that's somebody who you should listen to giving you a fact. Oh, then you're you're way too humble for for what what you've done, because well, for starters, I'm no every humble no, buddy. <laughs> no, ev no, everyone uses the end quote thing. Do they? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. That, that's that's the default now. That's the default. <laughs> that's funny. Oh, uh, well, see, I learned something I didn't know right off the bat. Well, amazing. But yeah, please, uh, if you if you could listen to one episode of my show, I'd recommend you check out Chernobyl episode. That that's that's a thing. That's the moonshine that one. What is that? The moonshine one. Yes. <laughs> hey, hey, the good news is, if you could have gone back in a, in a time machine to interview those people in the Russian Civil War, the moonshine currency, I bet, would still be good. <sighs> Moonshine currency kind of worked. It, it worked as literal currency in these parts. It worked with the Mongols matter. too. I mean, that, you talk about it, one of those international currencies all throughout history. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one other thing is that, well, by the way, you you once in your show, I don't remember where exactly, but you mentioned that you know the United States could have just collapsed the Soviet Union by bombing us with jeans and uh, like Coca Cola. No, I think it was porn, rock and roll al albums, and jeans. Yeah, that's what. The, that's exactly what actually happened. Except yeah, in Bombas, we that smuggled was my, that in. That was my stepfather's famous plan to destroy the Soviet Union. <laughs> and and for for me, like the biggest culture shock thing was when I researched thing on music. I found out that the same songs which were kind of frowned upon by the conservative part of the American society as having socialist influences and, you know, ruining the youth, were the very same th songs prohibited here in the Soviet Union for ruining the youth with capitalist evil influences that they might, that rock and roll might turn people capitalist. Oh, that's funny. I had a buddy who went very early on when you had to be in a special group to go to the old Soviet Union, you know, and they would watch you like a hawk. And and they offered him an amazing amount of money, even when they were poor as dirt, in this, for his blue jeans. And he said, the minute they did that, I knew that whole society was doomed. Dude, blue jeans. <laughs> you might not know this, but blue jeans on the black market cost 200 rubles. I, the, I know. At That's the time where the monthly salary of, an, of a, like an engineer, like civil engineer having a master's degree and everything was 120 rubles. 
doomed. They were that crazy. Totally doomed. <laughs> but yeah, we, we survived. Like, uh, one of my favorite bands uh, has this in their lyrics, uh, like, Lithuanian band, and they, 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 they sing that, you know, we survived the Reds in two world wars. You, you can't really surprise us anymore. <laughs> but this is... Well, we're we're kind of we're kind of proud about you know it's a matter of local pride that you know we outlasted the Soviet Union and we've also been targets of a crusade and you know our culture still still lives on for some reason somehow. Well, see, that's where you people are different than us. We in the U.S. have such short memories when it comes to all. Well, we have such a short history, see, and and everyone comes from a different place, and and so, but you know what? I mean. It's one of the differences with Europe and the United States that I like. I think it's nice to have a fresh approach sometimes and let the past go. And yet then when I go over to Europe, I'm so touched by how how they keep their history in their heart. So I'm kind of t t torn, you know, as between the good and the bad. But but there's no question. I mean, when Americans go to Europe, they're always amazed by how long the memories of the Europeans are. Well, that's that's how we we've been killing each other for centuries and, and perfecting it and doing it well. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but you know, that that that's how it kind of is. And we over on the other hand are very surprised when Americans like you, you have this entrepreneurship going on because we are we've grown very extremely cynical and jaded here. Like when I mentioned to Latvian people that I've started doing something on the internet, doing a podcast, the first reaction first reaction here was, Oh well, you're gonna fail. Why do you do this? Everyone's very depressive and always expects expects only the very worst to happen. And, and Americans, you, you have this excellent spirit of, of optimism, of, you know, do it, entrepreneurship, all these things. I, I think You know what, though, I'll tell you, there, there's a view among some people in America, and I don't think it's wrong, that sometimes we siphon off all of your entrepreneurs. Um, because when people come, like, I happen to know... Um, I wonder where Jonas is from, my friend Jonas, I don't know. But... but you know, when people say from Eastern Europe come to the United States, I'm always amazed by how they throw themselves into the entrepreneur stuff and how amazingly successful they become. And I always think to myself, yes, and then we stole that person out of his home environment where he could have done that for his own people. And they, so anytime you guys get your entrepreneurs who can see, oh, I can really do this, maybe they leave. And then you're only left with the people that say you can't make it work because we have tons of wonderful Eastern European entrepreneurs here in the U.S now so maybe we just stole all of your entrepreneurs well m maybe or something oh yeah by the way the, you you'll like this i i just uh i i dug up my old nice because i i i work from a ton of like old soviet era newspapers and everything and i have just and i know that you are kind of a fan of punk rock aren't you well yeah oh yeah. Well, great i found out i found the list of like prohibited prohibited bands from the 1985 this already is from i, I guarantee the you thing. the dead kennedys is on there wait a minute I'll, I'll look at this nope not in here but there's there is acdc for neo-fascism and violence oh that's not a punk band there's pink floyd for interfering the policy of ussr that's not a punk band. There's Sex Pistols for punk and violence. That's a punk band. There are a lot of punk bands here, but they're they're like they're, they're they just throw everything. They they call Ramones punk. Yeah, yeah, they are. Well, but they call everything. And, and for some reason, there are just stuff thrown in there. Black Sabbath, violence, religious obscuritanism, spelled with a K, because this is for tourists. I love that rich obscuritism. At any rate, uh, please, Dan. As usual, for all of my guests on the show, please have your final word for our listeners now. A final word? Um, yeah, you, well, you get to say something smart now. I get to say something <laughs> smart? Well, listen, my, my something smart is I really hope we can figure out a way to diffuse the current tensions because right now everything seems to be going in the direction where it's heating up continually. So hopefully everybody can get some um, cooler heads to prevail because if for no other reason than... I mean, you folks are. If there's going to be a new World War Three battlefield, your people know they're right in the middle of it. So I would love to see some cooler heads prevail. Same here, Dan, and thank you for being here. It was a pleasure to work with you. Thank you for having me and for all the nice words. Thank you. Well, and listen, you know, when you said that that we could do something out to help the Latvian people, I, I'm glad to be able to take an hour out of the day. And if if that really comes to pass, I'd love to think that I could have done that. So. That was great. Uh, let me let me know how it goes, okay? And listen, congratulations on all your success.
oh, then thanks, Dan. It's just, you know, <clears throat> I kind of feel approved. <laughs> Cause, you, cause are, really, you are approved. <laughs> this this really started on your boards just randomly because I collected the studies of, of people serving in the Soviet army and just posted how it was like there and uh, and yeah this is this is my my final this this won't be on the show but when I when I basically read that uh, the Soviet like this Russian uh, ship had basically crashed and and sank, and sank down in in the Black Sea recently. Then I just knew that someone somewhere was terribly drunk. 100% chance. Nothing has changed. 100% chance. <laughs> Take it easy, buddy, and let me know if I can do anything to help you in the future, okay? Okay, man, and, and thank you for being here, man. Anytime. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you.